Katie Green from uh, Dover High School in Dover, New Hampshire. Welcome to the Anatomy and Clay Learning System Podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for your time today. And be before we kind of dive into all the details about your um, classes and what you teach and how you use Anatomy and Clay, can you just tell us a little bit about Dover, where you're located, and a little bit about the community itself? Yeah, so Dover High School is located in the seacoast of New Hampshire. We're a really, really small area, only about 12 miles of coastline. Um, so we're a little bit off the coast. We're up the river a little bit. And so we have um, our high school is kind of situated in a very like urban suburban area, but we're also pulling in students from a couple different um, more rural communities as well. So really, we have, I think, about uh, like eight communities that can pool into our high school specifically for career and technical education, um, which is really great. And animal science is one of those um, wonderful programs that students have access to. Is it fairly popular, the, your program? It is one of the most popular programs at our high school. I think um, cosmetology and um, nursing is like a close second. Um, and we usually have a wait list. We have about 120 seats a year, and we usually have a wait list between 10 to 15 people um, that are trying to trying to get in here. Wow. Well, how, how big is the, the high school itself and or number of students you have in your programs? So get... we have... Um, Oh gosh, we are our so our high school proper is about um a little around like four thousand students. Okay. Yeah, um, wow. and then on top of that, we have about um like six to seven hundred. I can't remember what the number is this year of just sending students that are adding to our population just coming for the career technical programs from other communities. Gotcha. So is your particular facility located in a separate campus or? area from the main high school so thankfully we are blessed with like our own specific like little building um on our high school's campus so we're like a little bit separated which allows us to have um some fencing for our larger animals we have an extra an extra exercise pen oh Hello, please come to the attendance office <laughs> little announcement there the yeah. reality of being in the school that's great yeah, yeah. um so yeah like um yeah so we have a fenced in area for our animals so our our facility it's like a, a metal building which is really nice we have two classrooms in it a dog grooming lab so it's actually like a business that we provide for the community so our students are getting hands-on skills in dog grooming customer service money handling um and then we have in like the back of our building so like the classrooms are in the like the front in the more, more announcements no Yes, no. <laughs> in in the, the classrooms are in the front with the dog grooming lab kind of sandwiched in between and the rear of the building is like our barn and like our animal care spaces. So like all of our animals are like housed within our building. So like I can, we can take the lab on the go. It's very flexible. Um, and it's just a really good space to be in. We've been in this particular space um, for uh, four years now. So our high school had was on the list for renovation uh, a couple years ago. And thanks to a lovely federal funding program called Perkins, um, we were able to um, get extra money specifically for the career and technical side to modernize our labs and make sure that we have everything we need to provide these students a real 21st century education. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I, I got to ask what kind of animals do you have? So we have a collection of about 75 different animals, <laughs> um, ranging everything from guinea pigs and rabbits to snakes, alpacas. Um, we foster some dairy cattle, sheep, goats. We have a pig. Nice. Um, if, it's, if it's something that you can keep on a farm or that you might have as a household pet, with the exception of dogs and cats, we have either probably have it currently or have had it in the past. Well, just you know, managing that that group of animals requires a fair amount of attention to detail and work and um, care, obviously. Yeah. And, and thankfully, like part of our curriculum is the students are really learning to care for all of these animals. So thankfully, it's not on me and my co-teacher to put in the extra hours. And we actually like students can apply and like work for the school um, on the weekends, holidays, um, and they actually can come in and use this as like another job training opportunity. Yeah. How about a little background on yourself? How did you end up uh, being an animal science teacher in Dover, New Hampshire? 
Yeah. So um, I kind of didn't think I was originally going to be a teacher. So my background is actually in dairy cattle management. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, not necessarily on a dairy farm, but I worked in a, a did a lot of work through 4-H, which is a after school youth organization that focuses largely on agriculture. And I was in the dairy project. So I had a calf every year that I would show at fairs like Big E and things like that. And then that's what I decided I want to go to school for. I wanted to, you know, specifically be a dairy cattle nutritionist. So essentially a dietitian for cows. Um, but then the more I got through my program, I was out at, um, so I moved away from home. I was out at Cornell um, for a couple of years and decided with my work study job, I ended up working for 4-H and really liked the idea of working with youth in this field rather than the idea of going out to Wisconsin or the Midwest where the big dairy farms would be and like the big dairy firms would be and companies and such. I really like the idea of teaching kids about cows was kind of what what changed me a little bit from from my career path. That and um my advisor told me I needed to take organic chemistry and I decided I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so that kind of helped help uh, set me a little bit on this path. Um, I came to New Hampshire, just I wanted to be back in New England. I really liked New York um, and there was a lot of job opportunities for me out there, but um, I came to UNH to do my master's. My husband also was there getting his PhD in math. And uh, so that worked out really well um, for that kind of life planning stuff. And it worked out that Dover had um, an animal science program right near UNH where I could do my student teaching. And one of the teachers decided to leave. And so I was able to kind of step in her position straight from student teaching into the full-time work, which was, it was kind of, you know, always things happen for a reason, people say. So I kind of walked into a position and the teaching position was specifically teaching vet science which I am not a veterinarian, no way, shape or form. I'm really good at the anatomy side um, and like how things work and kind of like the health piece and the practical health piece, but not necessarily like the clinical um, stuff. So a lot of that I've learned on the job. I have really great resources in my community that, you know, professionals in the field that have really helped me make sure my curriculum is like relevant. That's great. And how, how long have you been teaching there now? This is my sixth year. Okay, wow. Very good. You're really settling in, it sounds like. Yeah, it's one of those things that like teaching about animals, you know, you you find what you're you're good at and what you're passionate about. And so I'm just glad that, you know, I have a, chose a really good career. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit about the classes you teach. Um, and then let's get into a little bit of how, how you incorporate anatomy and clay. Yeah. So um, our, our programs, our career technical program has like two levels with the option for a third year, which is usually like an internship or work-based learning opportunity. Um, so I teach our animal science one, two sections of that, which is like our level one. This is students who are just learning what's going on. Some of them maybe have never even like seen some of these animals before in their life and they kind of get a little bit of everything. And then honors vet science is actually a dual enrollment class. So they get college credit for it with through one of our uh, lovely community college partners. And that's where it's mostly seniors in that class. So I have kind of both ends of our spectrum. I have the sophomores and the seniors. And they're learning like this, this first kind of step into what is the veterinary profession? What are the things that we do? What is a job of a veterinary technician? So they don't get certified in anything, but um, they are basically prepared to step into a pre-vet program for four-year or a two-year vet tech program. Um, and for me, the vet science class is where we do most of our in-depth anatomy, because again, that's I'm trying to prepare them for that next step. Pre-vet anatomy and physiology in college is no joke. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so any little leg up that I can give them, um, they I've definitely had students come back and saying like, oh, thank you for torturing us, learning all the muscles and the bones. And so making us make those flashcard decks in high school, because now when I'm doing them in my college class, like they're a little bit ahead of the game. And that's for me where um, anatomy and clay has helped so much. So um, as we know, like most high school students, especially, and even adults, we're all very visual learners. We want to touch and feel and see things. And um, so we have uh, the Kanekin and the Equikin models. Um, and we bought those 
with the Perkins money. So if there's any career technical teachers listening, this is a great thing to use your Perkins budgeting on. Um, and it's worth it. You can definitely argue that. So that's just my little plug for my fellow ag, ag teachers out there. Use that Perkins money. Um, and so I typically, we do like, um, like a couple days on the equine model and a couple days on the canine model. We'll have them all out. Um, and it was really nice when we were building them. Um, so like the first year that we ever used them, we used the building process of them to learn like the bones. <laughs> um, and now since they're, they're all built, I just kind of, we put little sticker labels on them and kind of go through pectoral skeleton, axial skeleton, um, like the pelvic skeleton, kind of right. breaking it down. Right. Um, and then when we get to the muscles, it's a little intimidating, especially for the high school students to do it all at once. Um, so we usually break it down like head and neck trunk, and then usually like front limb, back limb. And I'll break students out each with one of the different models. And then they'll just focus on like their section. And I'll give them maybe five of like the core muscles that I want them to focus on in like each. And then they have to build it. And so it usually takes about a class. We're on 80 minute blocks, which is really nice. Um, so for, for people that might only have like 50 minute like period classes, because they have more in a day, it might be a little more challenging. You'd have to block out a lot more time. But usually for the purposes of what I'm doing, it usually takes me two to three days um, with my, my on, since they're an honors class, I can push them a little bit faster. <laughs> um, and you, again, you're not looking, I'm not looking for beauty. Like even if they just have like a tube or like a flat piece, as long as it's in the right orientation and they can identify the origin and insertion, um, that's really what I'm focusing on. Yeah. Very, very good. What, what, what's the overall reaction from your students when they approach this style of learning? They definitely like it more than looking at pictures in a book. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause, cause sometimes um, like it's hard to, to consider like, especially even if you're looking at really good diagrams um, and I have like some examples of them, some from some pretty hefty textbooks, it's hard to understand um, depth. So like superficial versus deep. And right. that's what I think the clay helps with most is that the dimension piece. Yeah. And we actually have, um, I don't have it. It's in, it's off in the other room. I, I can might show you after, I don't know where I put it actually. Um, we had one student who did for extra credit, wanted to do a whole half. And she came in, we have like this extra help period in the middle of the day called flex for like 30 minutes every day. And she like came in every day for two weeks and she sculpted the whole bog. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's really nice. I might um if I can't find it today, I can email you a picture if you wanted to like include yeah. it on that'd a post or anything. That'd, but um that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah. But yeah, so like yeah, and it is a good opportunity. Like you can use it in the lesson format, but it is a great extra, like something you could use for a student who wants to do an independent study. Um, like if they want to be like, oh, like yeah, like the way that we did it for the extra credit was then she had to like teach, like do a little mini, like five minute presentation, like about what she had done. Um, and again, it's not going to work for every student. She was very art inclined. So she was like very into the details. Um, but for, yeah, most students just being like, oh, okay. Like it covers the whole bone or it only covers part of it. Yeah. Or this is part of like a system. My favorite metaphor when it comes especially to muscles um, is that like muscles are just like a series of plastic wrapped ropes wrapped together with more plastic wrap and then eventually you get to like the whole muscle. Um, That's great. So. Yeah. Uh, approximately how many total uh, Equican and Canican model models do you have? Do you have a rough we idea? We have, I think, four of each. We either yeah. have four or five of each. Yeah, I think. nice. Nice. And do you, and do you go out and look at the live animals then and you know feel the muscles on the live animals? Do you do any comparative things like that? No, but that is an excellent idea. <laughs> <laughs> um we have done um we we do a field trip sometimes over to UNH so on their um horse um their horse exploration day um their equine class does paint like they'll do bones on one side of the horse and then they'll do like main muscle groups on the other side of the horse. And I do in, in the corner of my room, actually, oh, it's not going to show up because it's not my face. Um, in the corner of my room, I have a, 
a fiberboard giant horse model that does wow. have um that again this is from years ago so before me um these seniors for their final project made like a horse model it's pretty big it's about the size of like a miniature horse i think really and it has bones on one side with like little um little things and it has must uh little labels there we go and then it has muscles on the other side and that's what they were using before we had the equican models gotcha gotcha very cool w where did you learn how to work with anatomy and clay did you attend a professional development or did you just self-teach yeah it was pretty much self-taught um so we um yeah because just like for me like i learned anatomy all through pictures that was a you know my experience with it so it was like kind of interesting to kind of play around with it before we gave it to the students um and also just like I was built when we were building them we were building the models with the students so I was like oh yeah this is why this goes here this goes here and it's 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 funny sometimes because uh I don't think we put the horse the equicane heads on right so sometimes they fall off which is always a laugh <laughs> um <laughs> but like that that was user error on on, on our end definitely <laughs> um but um yeah so a lot of it is yeah just figuring out like okay and I think that's valuable for a teacher to kind of like, you have to work with it, get with it. So that way, you know, what student misconceptions are going to show up and kind of know what the bumps in the road might be before it gets into the hands of students. So I would encourage like people to, yeah, play around with it before you just kind of dump a model in front of a student. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I understand you were recently at a conference. I think you ran into some of our folks. Uh, was it FFA? Yep, it was at the National FFA convention, yeah. Did you bring some students there with you? Yep, we did. We had um, nine students. Um, we had an agri-science fair finalist and then our poultry evaluation team and our floriculture team. Wow. How'd you do? How did everything go? So we did pretty well. So our um, they do like a ranking system, kind of like if you're familiar with like the Danish system. So it's like based on your score, you get like a certain like blue red or yellow ranking um so our poultry team got um bronze ranking with um two individuals being silver two individuals being um bronze our floriculture team got silver which we're really excited about um with the same like two individuals silver two individuals bronze and then we're really excited about this one so our one of our seniors was our agri-science fair finalist which is essentially like a national science fair for specifically like agricultural topics. And she got ninth in the country in her division. Um, and that's in probably one of the most competitive divisions that FFA has for that event, which was um, animal systems for like juniors and seniors. And she did her project on, um, do the cycles of the moon affect the breeding of Holland Lop rabbits, which is, it's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. She looked about, yeah. uh, about three years of data crunching wow. uh, for that one. Wow, very cool. Well, it sounds like there's a real enthusiasm for both CTE in general, for animal science in particular. You've got a real strong culture there, I guess, or a community that, um, you know, is very supportive of this whole approach. Yeah, and that's like one of the things that like I really like and about like this particular um, like field that I'm teaching in is that like we are like a little family like animal science is going to be one of those places and like even other career tech fields as well where students really find out who they are um, they can because they're in their interest and for some people and this is where I think like it's so powerful is that we always talk about relationships relationships and education and like I've had students tell me that they're like animal science is the reason why I come to school every day. Animal science is the reason why I'm going to graduate high school. And any other career tech teacher is going to tell you the same, that like we are providing a really valuable service and it's the hands-on nature thanks to things like anatomy and clay that help us like elevate our classes. They're going to help them go on. And even if they don't go to college, just understanding the muscles, it's going to help them be a better pet owner. So like, oh, my dog sprained their leg. It's probably these. So like making sure like this is fine or with my horse, I'm going to understand more when the vet says that my horse tore this muscle or strained this muscle. Um, so I think it's, it's really goes beyond just like, you know, passing high school, like getting into college. It's really those like helping build lifelong skills. 
So, Katie, what, what percentage or just in general um, of the students that uh, move out of your programs, do you do you have a rough idea or a feel for how many go on to careers in animal science? Um, I don't have any good statistics, yeah. um, but definitely I would say prob at least like half of them are definitely going to be college bound, but maybe like closer to like 75% is like going to be college bound in like a couple of years. Yeah. Um, we do definitely have a ton of like a good chunk of our college round students are going into two or four year programs um, for either pre-vet or um, veterinary technology. I know personally of, let me see, I'm trying to think of my kids who graduated last year. Um, yeah, just my vet science class last year. I think every, all but two out of, I think it was 18, were going to college for some sort of animal related thing. Um, five of them were like four year pre-vet, like another four of them were definitely like two year vet tech. Some of them were undeclared, but were like definitely working like on a farm or at a pet store, um, dog groomers, um, dog daycares, and then like tra transitioning kind of into that adult step. We're finding that a lot of students nowadays, they want to like take their time. They're not ready to just jump head for head first into debt, which, you know, I appreciate yeah. That, yeah. that level yeah. of uh, mature thinking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say like a good majority of our students are trying to seek like further opportunities. And I have like a student, she went into, um, she's from two years ago. She went into the National Guard because um, she wanted to take advantage of the military paying for her schooling. But she's, even though she's a National Guard, like National Guard reservist, she's working on a sheep research farm right now, um, helping raise lambs that that um, colleges and universities buy um, for their their various research trials. So even though like, you know, she's an army mechanic, <laughs> um, she's still finding a way to use what she's doing. That's great. Wow. Sounds fantastic, Katie. And your passion and enthusiasm certainly comes through loud and clear. So your students are clearly lucky to have you uh, leading the charge on all this, um, all these programs and classes. Thank um, you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for the rundown. And uh, we wish you well in the future. And uh, maybe if there's another chance, we'll check in way down the road or something. Hey, sounds great. All right. Well, thanks a million, Katie.